My guest this week is Joanne Wilson, the Gotham Gal. We're going to be talking startups, angel investing, and women in entre entrepreneurship. Tune in. There is no stopping an idea whose time has come. But the best entrepreneurs don't stand still with an idea. They get to the business of getting things done. So step forward with your idea. And when you're ready, sit down and tell me how you want to change the world. This week, in Venture Capital. Welcome to This Week in VC. My guest today, Joanne Wilson. How are you? I'm, I'm great. Happy to have you here in Los Angeles. I love Los Angeles. Normally, you're in New York. Yep. Yeah, that, thus the Gotham gal. Correct. But uh, part of your childhood, you actually spent in L.A. I did. I was born here at... Oh, what is it? Cedars of Sinai? Cedars of Sinai. Cedars of yeah. Sinai. And I lived here till like the end of my sixes. And then right before I was seven, we moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan. You did? Yeah. Okay. Do you, do you feel like, a, is there commonalities between LA and New York that you feel is there a common thread? Or are they totally different in your mind? No, there are. I mean, for me, there are because I feel really comfortable here. My fa I have family here. Yeah. Um, and there are commonalities, I think. The food, the rest. Um, the edge, um, the art. Um, I like LA. Right. You know, if I had to live somewhere besides New York in this country, I'd probably live in Los Angeles. And if I had to live somewhere besides Los Angeles, it'd be New York. There you go. So, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think there's a theme here in my head, which is maybe like fall and spring in New York, and uh, I think I might be moving summer, towards winter, that. Summer, winter, winter yes, in LA yes. at a minute. Winter in LA. That it, could be my future. Exactly. <laughs> well, today I'd like to talk a lot about entrepreneurship about women in entrepreneurship and kind of tell your story uh, as the backdrop to that. So you graduated college, which college did you go to? I went to Simmons College in so, Boston. So tell us a little bit about Simmons College. It was an all women's college, yeah. which is kind of funny because I'm now very involved with women's issues, really surrounding around tech, and um, which is the big buzz these days. There's not enough women in tech and not enough women get funded. Um, I really went there because I knew that once I graduated, I would have a job and I had to support myself. Okay. And so, you know, I had that short moment where I took off my rose colored glasses and like made the right path, you know. So, is it right a pretty decision. serious school? Pretty. I don't know if it's a serious school, no serious in any other school, right. you know, but it is a very interesting environment when there's all women. Okay. Do you think that all women environment, um, leads people, I don't know, so question perhaps <laughs> that to, to, to be more focused on study as opposed to integrated with boys where you might have other distractions? Um, perhaps, and it's a different kind of competition. Yeah. You know, I mean, um, when you're there, it's all work. Okay. But you're in the city of Boston, so there's so many things outside yeah. to keep your, you know, from boys to restaurants to movie theaters to right. different parties so you know it was sort of in many ways I don't want to say like a commuter school because I live there yeah but you're in the middle of a city right I guess in the way maybe like NYU is where exactly. you're at the school but you're but really you're everywhere city. now if I'm not mistaken your first daughter went to an all-women's school no oh, she didn't no. I'm sorry I got no, that no, no 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 um, if I'm not mistaken, There's your daughter no did not go to an all-women's school. <laughs> no. She wouldn't have any part of it? She would have no... When it wasn't even on anyone's radar. And you know, I don't know... I wouldn't even suggest it. I okay. mean, for me, it was the right thing at the right time at the right place. Now, you came out, and what did you do after school? I came out, and I went to Macy's training program. Okay, Macy's being one of the larger department stores at the time. Yeah, I mean, that was it. Yeah. Like, if you got into Macy's training the program, that was the bomb. Yeah. And um, I'm not so sure it's like that anymore. Yeah. Um, um, but it was a phenomenal training ground because... You go through this three-month training program. They give you a complete overview of how the company runs. And then they place you in a um, sales manager position in one of the... At that point, it was not Macy's as you know today. There were only 21 stores. Right. I think there was actually 18. And they started to build some in Florida when I was there. And I got placed in Kings Plaza, Brooklyn, um, as a sales manager of a cosmetic department responsible for 150 ladies. Yep. And I was the only... 
non-professional sales manager across the board of all Macy's. I mean, when I went to the first meeting, I was the only person under 40 years old. But so you were a sales manager. Right. How long did you have to go through training till they allowed you to be Three months. Three months and they placed you as a sales manager responsible for a business in the store. Did you ever have to work as a sales clerk as part of that training? Nope. Never. And so... Do you think that would have been useful? No. I don't think no. it's relevant. I mean, I worked in, in retail when I was in high school okay. and in college, so my guess is that's why they placed me in this job, Okay, because I did have that kind of experience prior to becoming a sales manager, Right, um, but it was amazing. I mean, you were responsible for the profit and losses of this business in um, one of their stores. So your foundation from a very young age, sales, did you get involved with merchandising or that? Oh yeah, thing? oh yeah. Sales, merchandising, uh, dealing with customers. Uh, leading a group of people, training, all those kind of things. Yeah, I mean, the thing that was cool about Macy's, and I don't know how, again, how it works now, is that you're as a sales manager, right. and then you have to go through a series of interviews to get to the next job. So they say, okay, you're promoted, and now you have to go on these interviews. Sales, I mean, like interviews with buyers to see if they want to pick you up as an assistant buyer. Right. So you have to interview, and you have to learn how to interview all over again. Okay. I got picked up by this guy, and actually, I still remember, he said to me, are you organized? And yeah. I was like, very. Yeah. He's like, great, you're, you're hired. hired. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went and I worked for him. Okay. Um, and he ended up getting promoted and I ran it. And this is within Macy's? This is within Macy's. So you went from because running a, a, a team of people who sell on the floor, let's mm -hmm. say, to actually a buyer of product, figuring out what they should carry for future lines. Exactly. Okay. So you're an assistant to a buyer. Okay. And then the next job is you go back into store line. Okay. And you basically have all those sales managers report to you. And I was in New Rochelle and I ran one third of the store. Okay. Someone gave me great advice once, which I think is great advice for any entrepreneur. Which is? Which is when you get to store line, and cosmetics was one of my departments as well as all the women's clothing, don't spend your time in cosmetics where you feel comfortable. Because you already know that business. Right. Spend as l spend five minutes a day in that department. But people tend to gravitate to where they feel comfortable. Right. So I spend no time in cosmetics. So the broader message maybe for entrepreneurs is get outside your comfort zone. Totally like, get outside your comfort zone. Be good zone. at what you do, but force yourself, particularly at a young age, force yourself to learn new skills, do new things. Yeah, put yourself in a position and learn things that you don't know. Well, I'm going to throw something in and we'll come back to your narrative about um, sales because you and I both have experience in sales. What I find a, a mistake that a lot of people make in sales is they go into an account and they gravitate towards those people that they feel rapport with. And they spend all the time with the people inside their comfort zone. And the hardest thing in sales, I think, is to go spend time with people who you think don't like you. Completely. The kind of enemies, if we want to call them. And even going in and smiling and spending time with someone who you know supports the competition, right? And I find the mistake people make in sales is focusing on their comfort zone. Yeah. I mean, it's easy to focus on your comfort zone. But yeah. sometimes you spend all your time with your comfort zone, then that comfort zone dries up, then you're standing there with nothing. Yeah. And you went from being about, in total you were at Macy's about three years. I was in Macy's one, two, three, a little, actually a little under four years because then after I was in Storeline, I got promoted okay. to be a buyer. Okay. So, and that was like under three years. So very fast track. And what they do, which is good and a mistake, is so I was a buyer for a year. And after a year, I'm like, okay, I'm ready for my next job. Right. And they're like, oh, no, no. You're going to like do this for four years. Yeah. And I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> I was like, I'm, I'm not, not doing, doing this doing for this. four years. Yeah. You know, so, you know, it, it's a quick ramp. You learn yeah. the business and then you're ready for the next. And what came next after Macy's? I went to the other side. Okay. And I went to work for a company, sales for one year. Okay. The other side being you actually went to a the vendors. brand. Right. Okay. Did yeah. the brand, they manufacture their own clothes, they, they do their own designs, clothes. Yes. They, okay. and they sell to a variety of different companies. And if I'm not mistaken, when you did that and you switched from the place that is a distributor effectively to a producer, you started in sales, right? I was started in sales, and I also doubled my salary. Okay. That was the beautiful thing right. about why I went into sales. Okay. <laughs> And um, I was there for a year, and I realized that I really wanted to understand the other side of the business, which okay. is how do you actually make a garment? What are the margins? 
you know, how do you run a business in this? Not just selling it. And right. so I went to someone and I worked there for a year. But just before we get on to that, mm -hmm. I want to focus on this brief tour that you did in sales. It was about a year mm -hmm. or so. What did you learn in that experience? I mean, because you were quite successful as someone selling brand apparel. Mm -hmm. in, because I guess in, to some extent you knew the mindset already of the customer because you worked at Macy's yes. for four years. What did you learn in that process? You know, the one thing that I think... I brought value to in that process was that of all the buyers that I work with at that point selling to them, I understood their business. Okay. And most people who were selling in my position really didn't understand how to have a profit and loss right. and what they did on a daily basis. So maybe a lesson here, and I don't want to always extract if these don't hold, feel free to say <laughs> so, but maybe a potential lesson for startups. Because um, startups will either have salespeople selling or sometimes you don't have salespeople yet. Mm -hmm. You're offering a product to customers. And it'll sound cliche, but really understanding the business of your customers, how it works, what works, what doesn't, where the pain points helps you in selling, right? Oh, completely. And I also did, I also provided um, information for those buyers that made their lives easier. So they'd get back from their buying trip and right on their desk would be, a package for me, telling them what to buy, how many units, what it was going to cost, where it was going to go into their flow chart. And all they literally had to do was check it off and yeah. send it back. So there was, it made, I made their lives really simple. What do you now, you've been in sales, you've invested in companies, and we'll get to that in a moment, but what do you think makes a great salesperson? I think a lot of sales is innate. Okay. No, I think something that's kind of in your gut. Something like, in your gut. Yeah. I mean, certain people walk into the room yeah. and can literally shake every hand in the room yeah. and chat with everyone. And it's the same thing for a salesperson. Okay. So part of it is that ability maybe just to get people excited. Is that part of it? I think, well, a really good salesperson, yeah. not only to get people excited, but get people to tell you information that they might not have told somebody else. Okay. Right, so that they are sort of now you're beholden to you, and they want to create that relationship with you. Right. And I also think a good salesperson finds one common denominator yeah. with the person on the other side of the table that they can connect with. Right. It could be fishing, whatever so, it is. So you build rapport, mm -hmm. establish a personal relationship or connection, and the third thing that you said there was. Uh, being able to tease out information out of there. And this is something I talk a lot about. I call it crocodile sales. Uh, I think what kills a lot of salespeople is crocodile sales. They have a big mouth and small ears. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> encouraging people to let customers do more talking. Yes. Is that something that resonates with you? Completely. Completely. I, um, another thing that I've talked about is asking wide questions. I have sat, I, I sometimes go on sales calls with my portfolio companies, you know, I just like to go, you know, whether it's a biz dev partner, I mean, not traditional sales, but let's say biz dev or whatever. But so I have a lot of experience in watching other people pitch their business. And when you ask a question, leaving time for the person to go through the entire answer where they may tell you a whole bunch of stuff that you hadn't asked. Yes. And if you jump in too quickly after you ask the question, you may not hear that. I completely. Actually, um, years, years ago, we were, um, my husband and I were out for dinner with someone, and um, I said, I don't know what I said afterwards, and he said, say very little. Mm. And it's great advice, because the less you say, the more the other person on the other side gives you back. And as yeah. a salesperson, just ask the right question, you'll get the answers you need. Right. So sales is a lot about asking good questions. I often tell people you have to earn the right to ask questions. So one thing that I found annoys people is, let's say I don't know you, I turn up on a sales call and I say, well, tell me about your problems in your business. It's so disingenuous. Like Completely. I have to earn the right to ask you that question. So for me, I say sales is about establish a little bit of credibility and talk about similar situations. So we used to call them what, what we find. Mm -hmm. What we find was our headline, which is, what we find with some of our clients is they're experiencing issues like this. And it's a softer way of then saying, do you find similar problems? Right? <laughs> and sometimes they take the bait and sometimes they don't. And right. if they take the bait, then you've, you have to have established a credibility to get to what we find. But once you do, then you earn the right to start asking a little bit more. Right. And yeah. also, I don't think people realize a sales cycle can be long. Yeah. 
I mean, sometimes it's short, yeah. but it could take you a year right. to actually have a transaction between you and a company. And then once, usually once you make that transaction, you're pretty much in bed with them for a long period of right. time. If you service them well. If you service them well. Now, to some extent for me, it's not just, I think the best people, uh, it's not just about establishing rapport, but really building a meaningful, true relationship with that person. Like you almost have to be authentic and care about that person. Completely. And then that person will trust you and hopefully it's earned trust. And you know what you find about the best buyers is they can take their customers to any company they join. At, that's very true. I mean, when I went to the other side after having so many people, sales pitch, people pitch me, I mean, some of them were so disingenuous, I wanted absolutely nothing to do with them. Yeah. But when I became in sales and then went through my track in the garment center, I mean, I had a book this thick with all of my clients right. that came with me to each job. Uh, one of the things you said, and I don't think you've said it yet on camera, but we had this discussion before, <laughs> before. about how you're super organized. I actually think the best salespeople are also very organized because it's not like you go in, you have this great meeting and you get an order. It's the discipline of following up after with a nice email with maybe a link to some material. It's following up a few weeks later to kind of maybe even you do some tailored information to them and that discipline of following a process and also knowing that often when you're selling there's not a single buyer so you may have to go to three or four different meetings across the company and bring those people to a decision point mm -hmm. all of those things require follow-up discipline and attention to detail is that I totally agree and the attention to detail could be down to how was your son's birthday last week right right you know there was a guy named Harvey McKay have you ever heard of Harvey McKay mm -hmm. He wrote a book, and I often mention it as How to Swim with the Sharks Without oh, Being yeah. Eaten Alive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, kind of, I guess, at our ages uh, was more prominent, like when we were younger. Um, but he talked a lot about sales as a differentiator. And one of the things he said, Joanne, was um, everybody sends Christmas cards. I don't send Christmas cards. I send birthday cards. Christmas cards come in with a 100 other people's and nobody remembers. And Christmas is not personalized, or the holidays are not personalized. But your birthday is very personal, and very few people send birthday cards. He said, so I always have this great rapport with people. They always call me back after their birthday. That's very funny. It's pretty clever. And he said, um, I'm going to build a business where I am better at selling. He created a stationary business. It didn't have to be a newfangled tech company. He built a stationary business out of Minneapolis, Minnesota. He was just better at following up at sales. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you went to the other side, you sold for a while, you had some success. Like, do you have a measure of success? How big was the business when you? Well, you know, I was in the process of having ch children at that yeah. point. Okay. And so um, a lot of the decisions I made had to do with being a mother. Right. So I left this woman where I learned how to really run the back end of a business and I went to work for this guy who had he was a one guy I mean yeah. literally and a part-time designer okay. and he was doing maybe a million dollars a year and I joined him I liked him like I had a great rapport with him right. and he let me literally come in and take over the business and he was happy to do it okay and you know, within 18 months I'd grown the business to 12 million dollars from a million and a half to 12 and pretty a much half. And um, what was the what was the formula for that? How did you? Well, get we some? were in large sizes, okay. and then I got into Missy and I got into Petite, but I also created great rapports right. with buyers on the other side, right. and um, I knew how to do both because I had been on both sides of the business. So maybe again, just thinking about messages for entrepreneurs is get out of your office. Totally get out Go of your office. Go spend time with people, and don't always be in pitch mode. Uh, sometimes it's about establishing personal connections and relationships. Right. I mean, I gave advice to someone about a year or two ago who's no longer one of the companies I'm invested in. And he created this bad feeling. He thought everyone in the room was not doing their job and it created sort of a cancer in the, in the, in the company. I love him and he's gone on to do great things, but my advice to him was 
let's fast forward your life in 10 years. We're in a very small community. You never know who's going to be the next CEO of the company that you want to work with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think that's the thing that you don't realize when you're young is you just how small don't. the world is. <laughs> you definitely don't. How anybody that you come across is going to come somehow back into your life again. Yeah. Life's too short to be a dick. And Life is too off. short to be a dick. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So when I was there, I had a kid, and then yeah. I had a second kid. Okay. And I actually had a very good friend whose father was in that business and wanted to back me in my own business okay. at a, two separate times. Yeah. But I kept thinking, if I do that, I'm going to work all the time. I'll never be home. I want to be present. And in the end, I walked away from the Garmin Center, which is okay. a huge story, and I went home. And um, we moved to the suburbs, and I was standing in my house with two kids as my husband went off to work, yeah. thinking, oh, my God, how the hell did I get here? Now, <laughs> we're going to go into this in a moment, but let's just say this, Joanne, that I think people don't appreciate. When you're young in venture capital, you're not exactly paid huge amounts of money up front often. And this is something that perhaps people don't appreciate, but... You actually made more than your husband, if I'm not mistaken. Three times as much. Three times as much yes. as your husband. So when I stopped working, it was quite a shock to our system. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine. Yes. <laughs> um, and, uh, and this is something that's quite important for me, for people to understand, is um, this is often, I mean, you know, you are a woman with great sales experience. Salespeople earn money, right? If you know how to sell, you can bring, you know, bring in the bucks. And, uh, and you were... The primary breadwinner, the, the dominant breadwinner for yeah, a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk about what it's like as a woman, something I can't fully appreciate, <laughs> to then go from that to being a mom. I think it's, it, it's, it's hard. You know, you want to, no one tells you how you're going to feel when you have these children. And... Even if you continue working, you're still responsible for them. Right. You know, in my like fantasy, like sort of like I was going to run a multi-million dollar company, and my kids were going to be like in tow, all dressed up, standing there like saying goodbye to me at the door. And it was yeah. like I didn't think about like putting the food in the refrigerator sure. or who was going to take care of them when I went off to work or yeah. who was going to put the clothes in the drawer. I mean, there was no like no one tells you about but that. But you've spoken about that a little bit with your own mom, who was at times in her life an entrepreneur and if I remember correctly you said our refrigerator never had food in it we did our own laundry is yeah. that true yes we did at certain times you know and I think that that you your history yeah. is why you do the things in your life yeah and so she was always looking around the corner for the next yeah. and in many ways um, she was present but she wasn't present which is why I wanted to be present yeah and so I stopped working. And, okay. um, you know, I was in the suburbs, two kids. Yeah. We had a completely empty house of furniture. Right. We had absolutely no money. We were making, you know, hand to mouth. Right. And, um, you and know, I are was... Are you, like, around 30 at this point in time? I am, let's see, I'm about 30, mid-30s. 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 Okay. I was like Martha Stewart on crack. I mean, <laughs> I was like, you know... <laughs> I figured out how to run the budget so we could pull more money out of it. I was yeah. canning food. I yeah. mean, anything to keep myself, you know, occupied. Yeah. Um, and then at one point, I thought, I'm going to take a look at all these people on the play date. I don't hear a word they're saying. Their mouths are moving. I don't hear anything, and I'm going to kill them all. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, and um, you know, the truth is the Internet saved my life. Really? Yes. So? Well, I mean, it was the beginnings of the Internet. Right. And so... I was dabbling in some friends' businesses, sort of trying to help them after I had a third kid because I needed something to find my own identity. Right. And Fred came home one night and he's like, you know, Jason Calcana started this like magazine. It's sort of actually a couple papers stapled together. Yeah. And he's looking for someone, you know, can help the revenue side of his business. And I was like, really? I could do that. How old were your kids at that point? Um, one. Not even. A couple months old. Yeah. Three, six months old. Um, three and five. Oh, so uh, a baby, three and five. You had three kids under five and under. Mm -hmm. Well, this is, if I could word it this way, Joanne, this is the way my wife words it. You know, she said, I spent my whole life getting gold stars on my forehead. She went to Brown and Wharton. She worked in, you know, corporate strategy and then worked at Google. 
and always wanting a sense of achievement. And there were periods of time where she earned more than I did um, uh, when I was doing a startup. That's very easy to earn more than I did. And she was a good earner and uh, also really enjoyed her job. Then when we have kids, she's like, well, I don't want to be a career full-time stay-at-home mom. I don't think I can be a full-time career person and still be present for my kids, which mm -hmm. is something that you were talking about. And I think there's this great sense of conflict but between those two things. It's huge. And I don't think that the world is, I actually think there's a very big opportunity for figuring out how to take these uber talented women who maybe want to apply themselves part-time mm -hmm. and get the most out of them on a part-time basis. Well, I'm actually invested in a business who's doing that. So tell us about that. Which is Catch a Fire. And I keep talking catch about... Catch a Fire. Yeah, the women that are out there. I mean, we're in New York now, but we plan on rolling out across the country. Um, what does Catch a Fire do? I hate to... It's so simplistic. I, I always say it's the J-date of volunteerism. Okay. But in essence, nonprofits pay us to troll our database of serious professionals. Yeah. And um, I think women would be the perfect category for this. You have these women, it's not about volunteerism, it's about pro bono. And I think that's a big difference. Pro bono is someone who has a professional skill. And most of these nonprofits post these jobs that are like six weeks. Right. And they can find women, I think would be the perfect, to say, I could do that for six weeks. Short yeah. term, continue you know, my skills, keeping them sharp and fresh and, you know, maybe find themselves doing three jobs for them over the course right. of the year or doing a variety of nonprofit and jobs. And I have some friends who, um, after they have kids, they were very professional uh, in their youth, had a hard time getting back in, and they did things like recruitment on the side. They mm -hmm. would help with the executive recruiting because a good friend of mine, Kathy, would say, I can do a two-and-a-half, two-month project and earn 50K. Right. And then if I decide I want to do three in a row, I can do three in a row and be busy for six months. Or if I just want to earn 50K and be done for four months and focus on my kid, I can. And finding ways to get women involved like that matters. I think the internet, and that's why I think the internet now, there will be more, more and more opportunities are happening like that. Um, that women, you know, I say to women, don't get off don't get off the train when you have children like don't stop at a station because you need to keep your skills active. you need to keep your skills and you need to keep your database right. in terms of the connections and the people that you know and your relationships up I think there's something Joanne also about confidence because I know some of my wife's friends or just people I know through the network who have been out of the market for eight or ten years completely out mm -hmm. and yet I know how smart these women are but they don't feel it anymore. But they're wrong. Their yeah. resume is the last 10 years. Yeah. I mean, if someone asks, regardless of what they did, they just ran a household. Yeah. They're probably the CFO of their yeah. household. They're raising kids. I mean, that is a serious job that yeah. is like running a company. Right. And I think those skill sets should easily be applied to anything that you want to do. Right. So, I mean, I think if women who balance having kids and then want to dabble back and work, uh, I think at least having some part-time work or project work or small bits that both help with the resume but help with the confidence, help with the relationships mm -hmm. maybe is an easier transition, is it? I think it is. I mean, there's, there's so many different places to go on the net that you can find your community, yeah. right? And um, I would tell those women to find them. I want to talk about a generational thing, and we'll come back to the Calcanus thing because we can't pass <laughs> the opportunity to talk about Jason. Um, I want to talk a little bit about generational change. Again, speaking about your mom, you said, um, I guess it was a quasi, what, almost obituary you wrote for her on the Huffington Post, and you said she was of a generation where you got married young, you were in search of someone to support you financially, that's what was expected almost of that generation. Completely. Very much my mom's story. She was married at 23, had kids immediately, maybe even 22. She had kids immediately. And that was the expectation back then. Even as I look at women in the mid 40s, okay, where let's say, you know, which is my age, you, uh, you came out working, which is great. Um, but there weren't as many, at least if I talk about tech mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, there weren't as many women tech entrepreneurs 
when I was going through entrepreneurship. Mm -mm. I wonder, here's the way I framed it in my head and feel free to call bullshit if this is bullshit, mm -hmm. but it used to be that you couldn't really start a company until you were 30 because there was an expectation that you'd done a bunch of things in your 20s. And then at 30, you had to raise $5 million to get started because it cost you $2 million, $2.5 million in servers and software and web hosting and everything in Web 1.0. And so to ask for $5 million is a hard thing. So people expected more of you. And so if you were going to start at 31, as I did, you're, you're going right into your childbearing years. What I think's changed dramatically, what I, my great hope for women uh -huh. is that the fact that we've compressed the cycle down by 90%, meaning it costs 50 to 150,000 to get started, uh -huh will allow women to get started at 24, and men, by the way. Yes. But women in particular, because for 50 or 100 or 150, you can give it a chance to start your own business when you're young. And that gives you, and not to say you can't balance a family and running a business, but it gives you 10 years of that hecticness of running your own business mm -hmm. as a startup CEO that maybe you couldn't have had in the past. Is there some possibility that that's true well it's very true I mean this next generation is very interesting I mean certainly I hate to use the social network because whatever yeah but um, <laughs> there is a phenomena I think because maybe from the movie maybe from everything what we read on the in the papers that once you graduate college, why not go into startup? Right. And there's a lot of entrepreneurial. Are you seeing that more? Now? Yeah. Like oh my god. Last year. Totally. There's more um, kids in college that I speak to that are really pushing entrepreneurial shifts, um, including women, in, including women in their college and creating groups and having women think differently than going to go work for a bank. Right. Right. I mean, literally, there's a woman I'm meeting next week who wants to do a show for MTV about this next generation and how they all want to be entrepreneurs. Right. They don't want to be rock stars. There is something to, I think, the media attention that maybe people would be too quick to downplay, which is I grew up in the era of L.A. law, where so it I made being a lawyer sexy, right? <laughs> and every one of my friends wanted to be a lawyer. Miserable job. Most of them became <laughs> lawyers. And if I'm honest, I apologize to all my friends for saying this, but... Most of them were pretty miserable with it. And I think vicariously wanted to do entrepreneurship because there's something very satisfying about the idea that you control your own destiny. Yes. You choose what you do. You know, uh, If you work your ass off, like you get the benefit of that. And I, I do think there's something to the movie The Social Network and the awakening that you can do this that's helpful. Yeah, I completely agree. And you know, for women... The ability to be young and in businesses and then, you know, get off the ramp, get back on the ramp. You can do that with a little more, being a little more fluid than you could have done in the last generation. And what this generation of, I mean, my generation of women were told, go to the best schools, get the best jobs. You right. can do anything every, a man can do. And the generation and then, before was go find a good husband, that's right? right. So how far we've come, it's a great I think it's story, become right? really far. Because then you go do all those things and then you're home raising your kids and you have no identity. So by Jess, I, I'm just looking for comments. And by the way, now, if you want to ask comments, I'm going to start looking. I apologize, I didn't look before. But I'm just not noticing a comment, the CTO of diapers.com. Uh, let's see, Ken catch the fire, do the same for profit businesses, not just not for profit. That's actually from D V A S E F Y Devosophy. There you know, I actually spoke to a woman um in Cleveland um who wanted to do the same thing for profit businesses. The concept that she had spoke to large corporations like Kraft and Goldman Sachs and creating these mom turnships. But she never had the unfortunately the money she couldn't raise the money in order to seed her, fund her business and get it up, right? right? I mean, I like to invest in things once they're sticky and okay. they're proven. I'm not a big one on giving for the, you know, I have an idea, can you help me get there? Right. And um, yeah, I mean, there's no reason why what Catch a Fire has built couldn't work for a profit business too. I mean, I think there's something to be said, not only for women, but for anyone in this next generation to find the balance of work and play. Right. 
So I'm uh, just going to read a couple more questions off here to make sure we're engaging the audience. And I'll just read them as they come. Read the footnotes has asked the question, what kind of companies do you invest in as an angel that you lead the process? Too and, many. I, and, I, and, I, <laughs> and I will expand it to say, what value do you think you provide? Um, I'd like to get them all in here and tell me what kind of value I provide. Okay. <laughs> but um, I, I am a big believer, and you could certainly comment on this, mm. um, probably more than I could, which is I believe in your betting on the racehorse, right? right? I hope they have a really awesome horse, but if they have to change the reins somewhere midstream, yeah. I'm okay with that. Um, funny enough, I have really, I haven't invested in all women businesses. Right. I think it's really important that there are women in the businesses, um, but the majority of the businesses I've been investing in recently have been um, women businesses. Okay. Um, and it's not so much I only want to look at gaming companies or right. food companies. What I like about the web, particularly for all these new businesses and for women, is that the web is a platform yeah. to build a business. Right. And you look at something like Food 52, mm -hmm. which I'm an investor in, that he's created. An Tell us what Food 52 does. I know that uh, Jason Rapp keeps telling me, you've got to talk to oh, Food yeah. 52. Right? <laughs> um, um, Food 52 was started by Amanda Hesser, okay. who is... Um, Super smart, totally yeah. understands the food world, and um, um, is very competitive. Okay, and which I like about her. Yeah. And um, in essence, she's created a community, I believe, of the best home cooks in America. Okay, you know that every recipe on there is fantastic. The original. Um, do they do videos or is there's it videos, how to guys? There's how tos. There's an entire area, um, which is the pickle. Area, of course, now I can't remember the exact name where people crowdsource and ask questions. You know, what if I leave my chicken on the counter for 12 hours? Do you think it's still good? You okay. know, I mean, like yeah. questions. Um, and, um, you know, we're doing things with Whole Food and William Sonoma, um, and it's curated. Okay. So you know that everything on there is top, superior, and the site is beautiful. Okay. And food 52. 52. And Food 52, because originally the idea was pitched as a book. That they would do a contest every year with home, every week with home chefs yeah. over 52 weeks, and okay. then they would publish a cookbook. And with that, which is what they sold yeah. to Harper Collins for two years, is how they took that money and launched the site. That's great. Yeah. You seem to write a lot on the. It's is it the GothamGal.com or what is your yeah. URL? GothamGal. Gotham Without the. I only. I know your Twitter is the Gaff. Right, because that. when Twitter Twitter was launched, and I could have got. The goth, just Gotham gal. Gotham gal. I just sort of was sort of late to the party, and yeah. then I was like, you know what? You didn't and it know was anyone taken. who was involved with Twitter. No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and they refused to help me. Yeah. And so I am the Gotham gal on yeah. Twitter, which is sort of a bummer, but it's but not the end of the world. But your website is just Gotham gal. Gotham gal. Now I asked you this once, and you said you didn't think it was the theme. I always, because the thing I love about Twitter is uh, being able to serendipitously discover content and go look at things that you because left to my own devices I'm boring I would read the New York Times The Economist and maybe like I don't know tech meme every day right but I follow people who curate content for me and I follow you and I'll see you'll post something and I'll click on it I thought that you mostly wrote about food because it seems like every time I'm on your site, yeah, it's amazing. These, I don't weigh 500 pounds. <laughs> it, it is amazing. There's the you must work out a lot. There are these beautiful images of food and restaurant. And I'd say maybe the overarching theme of your blog seems to be food, uh, travel, um, uh, art, and maybe artisan type uh, activities. Is that your passion? You know, I'm all over the place. I think when I started the blog, which was like seven and a half years ago, I've always been a go-to person. Yeah. Joanne, where should I eat? Joanne, where should I travel? Where should yeah. I stay? What have you? And I sort of put that in the blog. So every day right. it's different, right? One day it could be something I made. One day it could be something we're traveling. One day it could be about one of the companies I'm involved in. One day it could just be a muse about, you know, I'm musing about something that really pisses me off. Right. So it, it's it's... You know, it's the Gotham Gal. It's, okay. you know, is um, someone said a life experience, a life experience the cross Gal. platform. I don't see as much, maybe I've missed it, like general commentary. Like, what do I think about how social networking is changing 
the way that people send out invitations or, mm-hmm. or something. Um, is that true? Is that totally true? red stamp? Yeah, no, I know you have <laughs> red stamp, but I mean, do you write? Have you written a lot about red stamp? I, do. I saw you wrote once. I wrote it. once. You know, I probably should write more. Yeah. Um, but um, I maybe, don't know. Why. Maybe maybe mm-hmm. my line of questioning is really to ask: Are those the areas a that you're most passionate about? Food, art, culture, music, uh, artisan, crafts, travel, and if so. Does that have any correlation with what you invest in? Um, I think the the investment it was, it was going back to what do I provide? Yeah. I think one of the things I provide and things I really care about the most, which is actually something I learned back at Macy's, which is why I love being a system store manager the best. Yeah. I love mentoring people. Okay. And. It is thrilling to me to see my the businesses I've put money in and time in to grow and go to another stage, um, you know, reach the next mountain and then right. hang out there and then go up again and get yeah. to the next one, and um, you know, give them advice and have someone to think out of the weeds with them. Right. Um, and I really enjoy that more than anything else. All the other stuff. Yeah is sort of background, okay. but it probably provides an interesting dialogue and thought process into the conversations that I have. I, I, I think we think a lot alike, Joanne. I, uh, so my themes are, I talk about the four M's of investing. Management, market size, money, which I'll talk about, and momentum. Management, I tell people 70% of my decision. It really, you called it backing the horse. but. I've just been around the block enough to know that everything changes. You launch a business and then Google announces they're going to compete. You launch a business and your head of tech leaves. You launch a business and September 08 comes along or September 01 comes along. It's how you deal with adversity. It's how you motivate your team. Mm-hmm. It's your ethics. It's how you deal with customers, like all those things. So I like to tell people that I invest in lines, not dots. And what I mean by that is when I meet you once, you're a dot, like, you know, time. And then performance. Mm-hmm. And over time, sometimes those go up. Like you launched new products, you got in the press, you got your first customers, you uh, have hired you know more people, and you raised a little bit of money. And those are all dots. And then comes along adversity, and maybe it goes down a little bit, and then it goes back up. And as I look at that over a period of eight or twelve or fifteen or eighteen months, I almost don't even need to think about like how well you pitch your PowerPoint deck or your right. demo. Right. Totally agree. It's like. As a human being, do I think that you're the kind of person that's going to get through all this? So, Joanne, we both agree that management is the predominance of what we look for, but uh, market size really matters, particularly to a VC. Yes. Is it the same for you as an angel investor? You know, it's interesting. Um, This is a conversation that has been one of the big things in women in tech, right? They get really frustrated that VCs... They don't. They're not getting funding from VCs. Right. They're not getting funding from VCs. And one of the things that women are women aren't. Okay. Women are. I mean, some are. Yeah. Very few. Okay. Why? 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 You know this whole thing. And I always say, well, they don't understand your business. You don't mm. want them their money anyhow. Right. But not only that, I like to know how many men pitch versus how many women pitch mm-hmm. and what the percentages of people yeah. that get funded. But VCs need to invest in businesses that have large market caps. Right. Because you have an entire group of people that invested in you. Yeah, that are expecting returns. That are expecting returns, right? So you're not looking for a nice little $50 million business. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you know, sometimes that happens. Mm -hmm. Fine, you know, it's it's all relative to how much you put in. Yeah. You know, but I think that's a big thing. You'll like this story, which is our single best return of our last fund, we returned about well, we returned hundreds of millions, let's mm-hmm. say, on one deal. I don't know if I'm allowed to release the exact number. Mm-hmm. Hundreds of millions on one deal was run by a woman. That's awesome. Yeah. So. Well, I think one of the things that the, the whole women thing is I think I believe that women bring a completely different set of eyes, thoughts, and um, uh, history to any of these companies. How do you believe women are different in business, in management? than men, or are there differences, do you think? I think there's totally differences. Um, Women don't necessarily feel uncomfortable asking questions. Okay. They're more... um, 
it's not that they're not competitive, but it's a very different kind of competition. Yeah. They're much more embracive. Yeah. They s generally speak in terms of we. Did you ever read the book, Women and Men in Conversation? The mm -mm. book was called You Just Don't Understand. Or the women are, was it men are from Mars, women are from Mars? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I remember reading this in my 20s. And one of the things that said, and it always stuck with me, is that men are competitive with each other about information. Mm -hmm. And it's all about how I can one-up you. So I read information, and I come into the office and say, did you read about it? Oh, you didn't read about it, right? And so it's always like, and women are... Uh, a lot more about how we bridge and all get along. So it's less of trying to one up and more saying how can we find commonality. Mm -hmm. Is mm -hmm. there some truth to that? I think there is some truth to that. I also feel there is something, men tend to puff up their chest more. Yeah. So I just talked to someone this morning mm -hmm. um, talking um, about having an event that will teach women how to raise capital. Yeah. Right? I know one of my companies is looking to raise capital and she was, well, I don't know, you know, am I, am I prepared to take on that much capital? It's like, she's one of the best CEOs I've ever seen. Right. But she's asking those questions. She's being honest to us about her concerns, right. about what that means, what's the responsibility, exactly how are we going to break down that money, how are we going to put it back into the business. Most men wouldn't do that. Or men go on panels. Yeah. There's a whole thing in this Bloomberg panel that, was gonna ha that happened right. yesterday. 13 men, one woman. It was a big yeah. pa 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 um, and end up they were going to add women. And, um, you know, a lot of these men I know are huge supporters of women. But I guarantee you, none of them said, who am I on the panel with? Right. But a woman, I mean, I know when I have asked, who else is on that panel? Right. I'm going to a dinner party. Who else is going to be there? Right. I don't think men, it isn't, a, it, it just don't think that way. I must have that mild female characteristic. <laughs> Do you ask? I him? always ask, especially panels. You know, <laughs> I especially ask if Dave McClure's on, so that I can not be on it. But uh, <laughs> uh, I love Dave, but he's a pain in the ass on panels. Uh, but I do think about who's going to be on the panel. I hate panels to start. Uh, my, right? so I, is my husband. I hate <laughs> panels. Uh, but if I'm going to be on it, I care about the dynamics right. of the panel right. and uh, whether it's worth doing. Um, so we said management, market size. What I said about money, I use that as a shorthand for uh, you need to be disciplined about the price that you pay as an angel. Mm -hmm. You need mm -hmm. to be disciplined even as a VC for your stage. And I feel like in the last year to a year and a half, a lot of people, people have lost are. that discipline. Yes. And we like to say at GRP that we are disciplined but not cheap. Okay. You need to understand if you're looking at something that's hugely trending up, you need to be in those deals. And if you're cheap at the wrong time, you miss amazing opportunities, but you need to be disciplined. And so we don't do uh, unpriced convertible rounds. It's just, um, you know, part of our I discipline. I hate convertible debt. So do I. I, I. It's like if you have a company yeah. and you actually have revenue stream coming in and yeah. you have people looking at it yeah. and using it, you're worth something. Yeah. Put a price on it. Agreed. The last M is momentum, and it's the hardest thing for people, but that's my lines, not dots, which is there's no such thing as funding season. Always be raising. Uh, you can say you're not raising. You can say, listen, I'm just here to meet you to tell you about my business. We're not yet raising, but that's raising. Right? Exactly. So ABR, yes. always be raising. I totally agree. Or I'm for sale any time of the day. Yeah. It just matters what the price yeah. is. <laughs> I won't go into my prostitute example on that one. But, um, Klain Gagger, uh, C-L-A-N-G-A-G-E-R, is the person who had asked about the competencies that, oh, sorry, it was a slightly different question. What are some of the core competencies you've seen in others reflected in yourself that are key in successful entrepreneurs? We talked about this I, today or earlier. Yeah. I think organizational skills yeah. are very important. Um, I do think being able to sell yourself as an entrepreneur is really important. Yeah. Um, you know, the entrepreneur that sits in the corner and is sort of like a little wallflower. Yeah. Regardless how fantastic that business is, they're not gonna they're gonna have a hard time having success. Right. Um, you know, and I also like talking to people that I that look at their business and think. This is what I'm going to do first. And then we're going to see the next possibilities. Looking at the big picture, but understanding that 
if it doesn't go this way, we're not necessarily doing number two. We might right. actually now be doing number four. Right. And someone that is very good at weaving and bobbing and looking at a big picture. I think that's really important. So we were talking about, you made a comment that I didn't pick up on and I'm now reflecting on, which is, are VCs turning down women in a higher degree than they are men or are less women pitching VCs? I can tell you from a data point, I think it's the latter. It's the la I just don't get pitched by that many women. So that's why my great hope is you have this whole youth population of women that are encouraged to get started in their early 20s. I will tell you, and any of my portfolio companies will say the same, I encourage every startup team of men to start hiring women. It changes the dynamics. Completely. They bring different skills. They bring different attitude. It changes the culture for the positive. Even to the point of some of the companies that I was involved with, like they're like, Mark, we know you want us to hire women, get off our back. But I think it's important. I think it's really important. I mean, it's no different than every company that I'm involved with. I have pushed every single one of them to create either an advisory board of their investors, mm -hmm. three to four people, yeah. or a board, depending on how far along they are. Because when you get a group of smart people in the room that care about the business, everyone is going to give you a different sort of window on how the business could go forward. Right. And those are great meetings that allows a CEO to think out of the weeds every six weeks. It's the same thing with bringing in women into a business. Yeah. They take a look at it differently. They um, understand things differently. So it's not just about your team, but your board, your board of advisors, Everything. the coaches, everybody getting a balance of male psyche and vision and women's psyche and vision probably is helpful. I think it is. Um, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsor, which right is ahead. Fenwick & West. Fenwick & West is a law firm with a national footprint. They operate in, in LA, New York, Silicon Valley, um, very strong in Silicon Valley. They work with big companies like Cisco and Apple, but they also work with startups. Um, they have a great thing on the topic you spoke about, which is uh, why you shouldn't raise convertible debt. <laughs> and they're public, why you shouldn't raise convertible debt. Ted Wang, who keeps a blog, had written about that. They've put out a series of uh, legal documents which are open source. You can use them to get your legal costs down when you're an That's early awesome. stage startup. Yeah, they do a lot of stuff that promotes entrepreneurship. I uh, actually had them as my lawyer when I was a startup. The way I got uh, started with them is I was at an event, Sam Angus was there, and this is a message maybe on marketing. Um, and he stood up at the event, he sponsored the event, and he said, look, I'm not here to tell you all this great stuff about Fenwick and West. We sponsored the event because we believe in entrepreneurs and getting entrepreneurs together. And you know, there's several entrepreneurs in the room who use us. And if you're out looking for a law firm, talk to them. They're our best champions. And that was all he said. I'm like, oh, that was classy. Because you know, normally they get up and you're like, Yes. You know, like when the accounting firm gets up and tells you about all their shit and mm. the lawyer gets <laughs> up and you're like, Christ. And, um, you know, I don't, I think it may, so your husband sort of popularized this term earned media. Mm -hmm. I think he said it came from your brother or someone in your family. I don't know if it did. My know. brother. It was your brother. So how did he come up with this idea of earned media? What does your brother do? <laughs> My brother runs a production company. Okay. And, video production? Um, um, no, well, advertising. Okay. They also do movies. Okay. Um, they're doing a lot of stuff on the on the net as well. Okay. And so he had Epoch this idea. Films. Of, what's that? <laughs> Epoch films. Epoch films. And 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 your brother had this idea of earned media. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that's always resonated with me because I don't believe in big blatant advertising. Uh, I believe that if you put in effort in showing people how you give to a community that you will earn the respect and therefore the feedback, the, 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 the marketing benefit of that. So talking about panels, mm -hmm. talking about speaking at conferences, I always tell people, don't go on and on as a, with a company advert on all the great things about your company. Give people meaningful information. Yes. And they will know who you are. They'll say, oh, that person was clever and I want to go talk to them. And they'll know your company name then you've earned the respect of that person completely who then wants to learn more about what you do. Right, right. So I think it's an important concept to earn media. Um, so speaking about uh, uh, women in entrepreneurship, someone has asked directly if you have a higher bar uh, for fundraising uh, when it comes to women in entrepreneurship. 
or do you look at them any differently? I'll just read you the exact question. Yeah. By Jess. Mm -hmm. uh, Jess is one of those names where it could be a man or a woman. That's but right. Mm -hmm. I think based on her previous comment, I think it's mm -hmm. a woman. Uh, yes. Question. Being a woman, although I don't know if she means you or, or this person. By Jess, being a woman, do you place a higher value or a higher bar for women entrepreneurs when investing? No. Okay. Exact same. No, exact same. An entrepreneur is an entrepreneur. Okay, we have to get to this question. Mr. R-A-M-V, which might be Ramvez, I'm not sure. I uh, used to have a different name here. Uh, question, how was it working for JC? <laughs> Jason Calcanis, co -word. You know, it was... We could ask the team in the room here. <laughs> they... <laughs> you know, it was a crazy time. Yeah. I mean, that beginnings... He had Silicon Alley Silicon Alley Reporter. Alley Reporter. Um, you know, I went in, um, I was the first person. It was just Jason and you. It was just Jason and me. And, um, Jason was in New York. I was up in the suburbs at that point, working in my basement, right. fielding off like 150 emails a day what and like 100 phone calls and the fax machine. Yeah. Um, this was 97, 6. So, and you already had kids. 96. I yeah. had kids. We'll see. Yeah. Emily was... It must have been like 95, 96. Okay, so very early. Yeah, very early. And, um, you know, I said, well, I don't want, I was actually helping a couple of the friends. So I said to them, I don't want to, you know, you don't have to hire me. Yeah. You know, just give me a percentage of yeah. everything that I bring in for you. Right. And it was a crazy time. I mean, yeah. the funny thing is nobody knew that Fred was my husband. Okay. <laughs> Well, Fred wasn't known back then either, well, was he? Well, he just started Flatiron Partners. Right, it was new. Yeah, it was, it was new, yeah. but still. Yeah. And um, But he was a VC, so that gave him a certain stature right, at the time. Right, completely. Okay. And um, I was this point person yeah. for anyone that would start a company. You know, who should I call as a lawyer? Who should I use as an accountant? And we, I pitched this entire magazine is if you are starting a company, you have to have an ad in it because yeah. you need to brand yourself in the community. People have to know who you are. And... Um, you know, we really built that business up because the revenue stream from the advertisers. Yeah. And then we had these events that were these really fantastic conferences. Um, the beautiful thing about conferences is that you can sell the sponsorship and get the money before the conference even goes on. Yeah. And, um, and then we started an online um, magazine as well. Okay. And um, uh, it was a crazy time. So you ran sales for... I ran sales. And... Yeah. You know, for me, who was 10 years older than everybody, yeah. I mean, when they would hear I'd have kids, they'd yeah. be like, really? Yeah. You know, I mean, everyone was so young. Yeah. And, um, you know, everyone, companies were flaming out. Yeah. Um, everything was overvalued. And so what was it like working with Jason? You know, it was interesting. I mean, we also had, brought, he brought in someone else who put money into the business <laughs> that we all ended up losing. Um, um you know, Jason's a super smart guy. He's sort of an evil genius, and I don't mean the evil part. I mean, like, he's super, like, super bright, kind of. I think when he analyzes where markets are going, he's three steps ahead of he most is. people. He has a good guttural sense of where the is going. But he's less, also a cat. You can throw him from the 15th floor, and he's going to end up on his feet. Exactly. Uh, maybe less good at then taking that message putting it in a palatable form that doesn't make everyone else feel stupid. So sometimes I find that that filter is missing, which is you're like, I'll, I read anything Jason writes because I want to know what he's thinking. And I think he's he really is often ahead of people. But sometimes he makes you feel like that, I think, when he writes. I think he, um, it could be an asset or it could not be. Yeah. He said he loves to fuel the fire. Right. And I think many times he fuels the fire when you shouldn't be fueling it. Right. Some people have described it a bit like Howard Stern, which is, <laughs> you know, it's okay to have bad press because it drives awareness and whatever. Um, I think if you're a pure media personality, that may be true, you know. I think that's really what his best asset is. Right. As opposed to maybe operational leadership. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably yeah. true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What role... Uh, do you believe you've played, if at all, in influencing your husband and maybe how he thinks about either investing or companies or opportunities or any of that? <laughs> it's a family business. Okay. Mm -hmm. I would say that, yeah. And so he sometimes talks about this as even 
wanting to watch the way your kids consume technology Absolutely. as a kind of great driver of his own thinking. Absolutely. I mean, we're investing in businesses that are small today that hopefully will be used by everyone across the world five to ten years from now. And what a better ground to look at our children and how they are consuming that information as early adapters. Yeah. So final kind of thrust of our conversation, what to bring it all together into women and entrepreneurship, what things do you think we as communities, as leaders, as a society could do to encourage more women, entrepreneurship? What things do you think women need to do to better the situation for themselves? Well, that's a good question. I think, it's, I think it is imperative that you look at your company and you say to yourself, I'm going to have four people at the top, and I'm going to make sure 50% of them are women. Right. And if you can force yourself to do that, the women are out there. Right. I mean, there are phenomenal women in this industry that write code, that understand where we're going, that are great business people, that are great biz dev people, that are great sales people. Because then it's more representative of your ultimate customer base or because you believe it balances the way companies are managed? I think it's both. And certainly from an e-commerce and social media, I mean, women are the ones that are using these products, right. right? And so what better to have on your team is someone that understands it as a fundamental you know, level. I mean, you ask me, I can't imagine what it was like having kids and you know, getting off the ramp or what have yeah. you not. These men, not, they might use it, but they're not using it right. like women are using these right. products. Um, and I would say to women, particularly young women, don't go to work for these large corporations. That is something yeah. of the past. Right. Right. Is is great training grounds. Go work in a startup. Right. Don't go to get an MBA unless you're like pivoting your entire. You know, you're an engineer by training and you want to go into marketing and you want to completely pivot your career. Go work for these companies. Learn everything you can possibly learn, and you know, start on that path. Right. And if you are interested in technical stuff. It's okay to be technical. If your gravitation is more towards sales skills, it's okay to be on that side, but just start early with companies. Start early. Okay. Also, the next generation, they're all going to write code. Yeah. It, it is something that I talk to people about Everybody all the time. Everybody's going to write code. Even for young people who are, let's say, even 25 young, right? Not 15 young. I always say to people, uh, so I was at uh, NYU last week and I was speaking on the topic and I said, um, what helped me the most in my job now as a VC is I started out as a developer. I was developing software since I was 13, and I've lost some of the art of that, but you never fully lose what it's like riding a bike. Like mm -hmm. You understand the concepts much better. So I said, I think if you've never taken a computer course, consider taking one, even the most basic, even learn HTML or JavaScript or just Something. anything, right? And this lady came up afterwards and she said, well, but I'm so focused on my business, how can I do that? I said, cut out an hour of TV every night. Take an hour every night or an hour twice a week and take an online course. There's something like lynda.com, L-Y-N-D-A.com, mm -hmm. where you can take an online course. And you know, the, the beauty is if you spend a year thinking, like the thing is most people never start. And if you just start and you consistently do two days a week, for a year, at the end of the year, you've got something tangible. Completely. And that feeling of like being able to mold the clay will really help you as you're involved in a tech business, even though you're not a developer. Well, we'll help you talk to those people. Yes, they and understand them. Yes, and understand what they're and doing. And empathize. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so I always just say, get started. It's like blogging. You're never going to have a great blog unless you start and you just do it, you know, consistent, consistently yeah, over time. Completely. So I know you're uh, out here in L.A., partially on vacation. I super appreciate you coming into the studio oh, and spending some time with us. It was great. Thank you so much. Thank you and thank you to Fenwick and West. There is no stopping an idea whose time has come. But the best entrepreneurs don't stand still with an idea. They get to the business of getting things done. So step forward with your idea. And when you're ready, sit down and tell me how you want to change the world. This week, Venture Capital.